And then I wanted to thank you all, those of you that completed the pre-survey. We really appreciate what you said and wanted to let you know that we do hear and we do see. Um, you can see their statistics about who is, completed the pre-survey, 21% Chinese and uh, 14 Indian, seven Pakistani, Taiwanese, 3% other, and 52% do not have Asian ancestry. So we appreciate that everyone is here today. And 85% of you work with Asian or care for Asian youth and 55% have issues of race coming up in your work with children. So you're in the right place today. Some questions that come up, you can see there on the screen, uh, talking with children about race and racism and reaching out and welcoming groups. And then finally, the other uh, thing I wanna say is talk to you about is the things that you're hoping to learn from this, from this training today. So next slide, please, Claudia. There are some things that you said you want to know more about. How to support white staff to feel comfortable bringing up race with clients and families. And how do I support the AAPI families I work with in a non-biased, anti-racist manner? What am I blind to? I love that comment someone said. And I, I think today, if you keep your eyes open and your ears open and you listen and take in, we will all learn what we have been blind to and learn a lot more about ourselves and um, the Asian American clients and families that are in our community and we work with. So thank you again so much for being here today. We have three incredible speakers with us today and I'm going to do a short introduction to all three. First, we'll hear from Jennifer Chen Speckman, who is a licensed clinical social worker practicing in Oakland for over 18 years with children and families. She's worked as a community organizer, early interventionist, program director, and faculty member at UCLA, Loyola Marymount University, and USC. Her passions involve creating healing within interpersonal connections, whether it be in strengthening communities, therapeutic individual family and couples treatment, or parenting support. And then next we'll hear from Laura Collier-Chan, who is a contract and budget specialist here at First Five. She is a co-founder of a fourth grade teacher resource called Crossing Boundaries, Asian and Pacific Islander Americans. She also developed an exhibit and documentary about the Oakland Asian Branch Library as part of the Oakland Chinatown Oral History Project. And our third presenter is Glenda Kith, a data policy analyst for First Five Alameda County. Glenda was raised and lives in the San Francisco Bay Area as a first generation born Asian American. She graduated with a bachelor's at UC Berkeley and a master's at the University of San Francisco in behavioral health. So I welcome these incredible presenters for us today. We're so excited that you're here. And um, Jennifer is going to be leading us off today. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. I'm going to take a second to share my screen and pull up my slide. Looks great. Thumbs up. Thumbs up that you can see it. Okay. Thumbs awesome. up. Thumbs up. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for um, just being with us. Um, yeah, I just want to welcome everybody in. And um, I know that we're, we're doing things virtually these days for very good reasons. Um, and that also, um, you know, can sometimes take us out of our bodies and our, you know, kind of interpersonal connections with each other. Um, so I just want to welcome each and one of, every one of you all. Um, and um, really also thank uh, First Five, Beth, um, Leah who's not here, Claudia, and just the, also a wonderful opportunity to work with Laura and Glenda who are just amazing human beings. So just thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, so when I do trainings, I like to start with a, a different intro to myself, uh, particularly when we're talking about race and racism because I feel like it's very important to be self-aware and locate ourselves intentionally um, and locate ourselves within frameworks of, uh, you know, different legacies of um, oppression and privilege. So um, as you know, I'm Jennifer and I am a child of Taiwanese immigrants who came in the late 60s 
Um, and they were able to come due to the hard work of BIPOC folks in the civil rights movement to change immigration policy. Um, and um, I usually do a longer version of this, but I'm going to do a shorter version for today. But, um, you know, I was raised in the 80s and so I'm a product of a lot of television as a babysitter. Um, and, um, you know, I grew up really uh, navigating many different worlds, um, you know, a world where, uh, you know, I would dance to hip hop music outside and do the running man, you know, um, outside the home and inside the home at a very, very early age, I would translate text forms and call doctors for my parents and um, support them in navigating this, um, society. So uh, that's just a little thumbnail sketch of me. I forgot to turn up that slide, which is, this is my family. <laughs> um, all right, so these are learning outcomes and purpose. Um, you have the slides, so I'm not going to kind of read through them, um, but just give you a minute to take them in. And then this is kind of how we've structured and broken down the framework of this training. So obviously there's so much to be said um, on this topic. And um, myself, Laura and Glenda, we've worked hard to try to consolidate as much as we can in the two hours. And so um, I'm gonna begin with uh, kind of creating, setting the framework of our racialized society today. And Laura's going to take over, and then Glenda, and then I'll come back in with some um, applications, hopefully, to the work that you're doing in your everyday work. So, all right. So, when I think about our racialized society today, um, I very much go towards critical race theory. And I could, you know, we could do days on critical race theory, but um, uh, so I'm not going to be able to kind of uh, go into every single tenant, um, but it's important to um, just really acknowledge the hard work of those who um, collaborated together and communally to create this framework of analyzing, really critically analyzing what it infuses itself into all of our systems, whether it be childcare, um, education, uh, housing, food, uh, um, et cetera. So, um, these are, the, you'll find many different tenants because it's been what, like 40 years of um, dialogue. So you'll, you'll see different variations of this, but this is, these are the ones I tend to focus on. And um, for our purposes today, I'm only going to focus really on the first two. Um, okay. So, um, I, I've, I'm sure that you've come across many trainings and many conversations and many social media posts that talk about race. Um, and to talk about the Asian American experience in this country, I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, the, the historical system that we're really talking about, um, the, the kind of machine that's been at play for hundreds of years, um, is really not specifically about Asian Americans, but it is about um, a system that prioritizes white body folks over other body folks. Um, and that this system is historically um, been enacted in many, many ways that influence our present day. Um, but it's so infused in the way that we are um, in society together that, um, uh, you know, Beverly, I, I really love this um, quote by Beverly Daniel Tatum because, um, you know, she talks about racism as a smog, you know, and I think in particular in California, we're very familiar now with the levels of smog that can come up. Um, but the, the idea that it's so infused in our just even on a cellular level of um, these different implicit ways of being. Um, and that even though we can't see it at times, it does not mean that it's not there. 
um, and that race and racism and white supremacy, um, and I don't mean necessarily that folks, you know, some folks are, but not all. <laughs> when I say white supremacy, I'm not specifically only talking about folks with the, the pointy hats um, and hoods, but um, I'm talking about the system that prioritizes whiteness over other races. So um, it's important to just really understand that this is a very, um, uh, this, will, this will take some, some decades to unpack um, for sure. The second tenant is that um, race is a social construct. Um, and so when I talk about this piece, um, uh, sometimes I get the little like, er, you know, what are you talking about? So um, there really is no biological basis for our categories of race. Um, and it's really important to understand that these racial categories that we are very influenced by, you know, racial categories that, that cost lives, right? Um, these racial categories are constructed as a mechanism um, to justify racism and colonialism. And um, they were created in a hierarchy of races um, putting whiteness at the top um, and blackness at the bottom. And um, it's really important to understand this because um, you know, we're going to, we're, you know, we're, we're going to use terminology, we're going to use, um, you know, there's no way we can speak to every Asian culture, um, for example, right, um, that there's going to be these categories that are clumsy, and there's going to be sometimes dissonance that people feel like, wait, that's not me, or, you know, like, I'm pretty clear, I am Asian American, but I'm not, that's not the whole of who I am as a person. Right, um, and so it's really important to understand that this this concept of race, the socially constructed concept of race, is uh, deeply embedded. But it's also um, a concept that's created to justify racism. And um, as we kind of um, unpack that, um, th this means that the standard for humanity that, you know, where we default to as far as what is normal um, really is a very narrow window that prioritizes uh, white, straight men, able-bodied um, of a certain income, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But that is the norm in which we kind of center things in our society today. So I'm gonna hand it over to Laura and she's gonna give us more of that context. So um, thanks Jen for um, that grounding. Um, I'm gonna just do a short introduction of myself a little bit more and then we're gonna dive into the history section. Um, so my name is Laura Collier Chan. Um, I'm the taller in my mother's lap in that picture on the left. Um, my uh, mother uh, was born in China in Erico and Hoiping, and she immigrated to the United States when she was five years old in the 1950s and grew up in Chinatown. My father is white from New Mexico. And so I grew up with both of these communities. Um, my school year was always in San Francisco and my summers were always on a farm in outside Taos, New Mexico. Um, and so I grew up uh, with this blended family um, my parents were um, Asian American activists. Um, my father taught at um, San Francisco State in Asian American studies, and my mother um, was an activist as well, um, particularly around bilingual education. Um, and so a lot of what I'm going to talk about in this next section um, is the history of Asian Americans that I kind of grew up with. Um, as Jen said, um, storytelling, you know, as part of critical race theory, storytelling is really important. And so understanding Asian American history really um, um, helps us understand how to build resiliency in Asian American communities. So I'll be um, going through quite a bit of history in this next section, um, but we'll be covering how Asian American history is part of the broader history of Asian, um, of American racism, um, violence in America, 
um, and also going to critically be covering how Asian Americans have constantly been activists throughout this whole period. Before I start talking about Asian immigration, though, I want us to think about um, where we are and the land that was here before Asian immigrants came. The map on the right is a map of the East Bay and the Ohlone tribes um, that were settled here um, for hundreds of years. And I want to think about where you might be on this map today, where you've traveled as well. And understand that in the early 1800s, during the Spanish colonial and Mexican um, periods, there were over 200,000 Native Americans in the land that we now call California. But the United States takes over this, um, this land as part of the Mexican-American War, right around the same time that gold is discovered in California. And suddenly white settlers are rushing into the area to settle this land for the United States and to look for gold. And in the first two years after gold is discovered, over 100,000 Native Americans died due to government-sponsored murder, kidnapping of their children, and theft by these white settlers. The California government is estimated to have spent about a million dollars on this genocide. So this is when we talk about the smog of racism. This is the smog that, eight, that Chinese immigrants first come to California. It's an environment where there's high racial anxiety and genocide happening already. Now, Chinese immigrants are the first ones to come in large waves. They come um, uh, largely due to the gold rush, but also then they're recruited heavily to work on the railroads to help set, to settle this land for, for the United States. They're heavily involved in agriculture as well. Here in Alameda County, it's estimated there were about 68% of the farm workers here in early California. Um, and they were critical in the development of farms uh, throughout the Sacramento Delta. Most Chinese immigrants came to the West Coast, um, but it's important to realize that they were also recruited to certain pockets across the United States. Critically, after the Civil War, plantation owners actually tried to recruit Chinese workers. In fact, in Mississippi, they brought in 2,000 Chinese workers in order to blunt the, the rise of newly freed, um, newly freed African Americans. And so you see early on how Chinese are being pitted against, um, against African-American citizens. It's also good to know that there were Chinatowns not just in Oakland, but also in Berkeley and Hayward and, and where it is now known as Union City. And a little Cal um, Alameda history that is great that you can talk to kids about is that Lake Temescal and Lake Chabot, they were both built as early water systems to settle this area. And they were built as water systems by Chinese laborers. Lake Chabot alone was built by over 800 Chinese laborers in order to bring water to the new towns. Their um, camps were actually found by in the 60s. Um, a couple of kids were digging around um, Lake Chabot and they found actually archaeological site of the old Chinese camps um, that actually were building on these railroads uh, on this um, Lake Chabot. Another story that kids love is that the first flight in the West was actually right here in Oakland. He was a Chinese immigrant. In 1909, he was a self-taught engineer and he built a plane in a warehouse in Oakland Chinatown. Then he had to push that plane, imagine Oakland Chinatown, all the way up to the top of Piedmont Hill where he flew it, the first flight in the West in 1909. After Chinese immigrants, the next wave to come are Japanese immigrants. They come in large numbers to work on Hawaii plantations, but also across the West Coast in farming, fishing, and canneries. Japanese workers were also critical in building the agriculture infrastructure we know today in California. South Asian communities come around the same time as Japanese communities. They have a, a little bit of a different immigration pattern. Punjabi immigrants are settling mostly on the West Coast and working in agriculture, logging, and railroads whereas Bengali immigrants are coming mostly on the East Coast to cities and working as tradesmen and, and in restaurants. The Korean community has a slightly shorter immigration period, coming largely to Hawaii to work on the plantations and in smaller numbers to the West Coast. This is because Japan starts to occupy Korea and so their immigration is cut short. But it's really important to note that there are a number of political exiles, Korean political exiles in the US and cities that actually organized for Korean independence. The Filipino community has 
one of the most interesting and varied immigration patterns in, in the United States. They were actually the very first Asian immigrants to come to North America as early as 1565, which is pretty incredible. Um, but the actual numbers didn't start picking up until 1763. Now this is because the Philippines was a colony of Spain. And so they're coming over on Spanish galleon ships, settling in Louisiana, Hawaii, and Alaska. When the US takes over the Philippines, um, they come in another wave and this time largely to the West Coast and Hawaii. Here though, they have a different status than the other Asian immigrants I've talked about. Because the Philippines was a US colony, they were considered US nationals. So they're coming over with a different immigration status um, than the other um, immigrants, but still facing similar racism once they land. Regardless of the immigration pattern or the time period, the language or the culture, all these waves of Asian immigrants are treated essentially the same. They are treated as dangerous, they're invasive parasites, they steal jobs from quote unquote real Americans. But these white, Amer these real Americans are white immigrants, they have different rights and privileges than Asian immigrants. So European immigrants were allowed to testify in court and seek justice. They're allowed to own property and therefore build wealth and have stability. They're allowed to become naturalized citizens and therefore they have the power to vote and build political power. We're also freely made, allowed to have families. Women and children are allowed to immigrate as European immigrants. This is very different from Asian immigrants. Asians were not, Asians were not allowed to testify in court against whites. They were not allowed to own property and therefore cannot amass wealth or have any sense of stability. They were prevented from becoming naturalized citizens. This is critical because that means they cannot um, build power to vote through the vote. And they have restrictions on making families. Very early on, one of the first immigration laws is restricting Chinese women specifically from coming to the United States. There are similar laws passed later against other Asian, Asian women, preventing them from coming to the United States. This means they're there's an interruption then in the development of families. So we see very early on how there is a hierarchy built through the laws about who is considered a, a belonging and who is supposed to stay. And throughout this period, we see a lot of violence against Asians. This slide is the first, is some of the examples. There's too many to list, um, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, we see um, in Los Angeles in 1871, 17 Chinese residents were lynched. This is the largest mass lynching in US history and was in Los Angeles. One of the most um, um, common things to happen is what happened in Tacoma. In Tacoma in 1885, 700 Chinese residents were rounded up and expelled by a white mob. Their homes were burned and they were put on a train out of town. This became known as the Tacoma method. And these types of expulsions happened all over the West Coast. In California alone, over 200 towns used this method to expel Chinese residents from their towns. Similar um, types of activities were uh, applied to subsequent Asian immigrants. So we have in San Francisco in 1906, 300 attacks on Chinese immigrants. This was about anger over, inter over having Chinese students in their school, or Japanese students in their school, excuse me. And later in Watsonville, as Fil the Filipino dance hall was attacked by a mob of 400 white residents because they were angry that Filipinos were dancing with white women. So you can see how throughout this time period, there was a devaluing of Asian lives over those right, white residents. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act is passed. It is the first American law to ban immigration based on race and national origin. So the Chinese are the first to be outright excluded. After the other waves of Asian immigrants come, similar laws are passed against them. Until in 1924, the National Origins Act is passed. This bans Asian immigration outright with only very small exceptions for missionaries or professors or very, very wealthy merchants, a very small number. 
The National Origins Act also sets a quota on immigration for all nations. They set the quota based on the 1890 census. So imagine this, they are, the point of the National Origins Act is to freeze the demographics from 1890. And this is the immigration law we have until 1965, freezing the demographics of 1890. But with these new laws um, that at first passed against the Chinese and subsequent Asian immigrants, the, the federal government has to set up an immigration system now that never existed before. There just wasn't one before. They have to set up an immigration inspectors. They have to set up a deportation system and they establish mounted guards to, border, to guard the Mexican border to prevent Chinese immigrants from coming in from Mexico posing as Mexicans. So we can see how our immigration system actually starts with anti-Asian laws and then is beefed up and weaponized later against other groups. We often talk about the United States as being a nation of immigrants. And usually the picture in most people's mind is Ellis Island. But Ellis Island is a very different immigration center than what Asians felt, particularly Chinese, faced on the um, West Coast. When European immigrants came through Ellis Island, their average processing time was just a few hours. They come off the boat, they go through a health check, and they sail on through and land in New York City. Angel Island, right here in San Francisco Bay, if you've never been, you can visit it. About half of the buildings are still there for you to visit. Angel Island was built as an immigration station, but really it's a detention center to enforce the Chinese Exclusion Act. Unlike European immigrants, Chinese immigrants, their processing time was average two weeks to six months. My grandfather came through in the 1930s and was detained here for four weeks. You also notice that there are a number of young boys in this photo on the left. Boys over the age of 11 were actually separated from their mothers and placed in the adult male detention area. So we see early on the separation of families. This woman on the right is actually my husband's great aunt. This is a picture of her when she left Hong Kong to come to America. She was pregnant and with a young child. Her baby though, after two weeks in detention becomes ill and the baby dies in detention. She is totally distraught and the immigration officials will not release her to allow to go to the um, funeral services. And she attempts to commit suicide. They find her hanging in the women's laboratory and they have to cut her down and revive her. So this just shows early on how families of European immigrants are treated very differently than Chinese immigrants. And it sends the message to both Europeans and Asians about how our bodies are valued and who is welcome here. But it's super important to remember that actually all these different waves of Asian immigrants constantly fought for their rights and pushed back on these types of activities. There are far too many court cases for me to even list here, and I won't be reading through these right now, but constantly all these different waves of immigrants would pool their resources as a community to find a white attorney that would represent them and challenge a lot of these laws and a lot of this treatment. And a lot of the cases that they brought actually become foundational to civil rights and immigration law even now. The Yik Wall Laundry case, for example, um, found that a law may not be discriminatory itself, but it's if it's only applied to one group, it becomes discriminatory. And this is a settled law in 1886 over a Chinese laundry case. And also in terms of the social construction of whiteness that Jennifer was talking about, the Ozawa and Singh Ding cases in 1922 and 1923, the courts essentially say, well, it doesn't really matter if you're light skinned, it doesn't really matter what geography says us about what Caucasian means. What really matters is how would the common American see you as white or not? So they're basically codifying in these court cases that race is a social construct. Another way that Asian, um, Asian Americans fought back is through labor strikes. And labor strikes in the Asian American history go all the way back to plantations in Hawaii and on the um, Chinese railroad workers. But what I wanna highlight here are two cases of um, solidarity strikes. 
So it was very common for agricultural um, industries to have two separate work crews of different ethnicities. They did this to pit them against each other and to prevent labor strikes and labor organizing. This is very common practice. In, in 1903, though, this didn't work. The Japanese and Mexican laborers who were working for a sugar beet company in Oxnard, which is in Ventura, came together and formed a labor association together. Over 1,200 of them went on strike and they won their demands. It's the first successful strike, agricultural strike in Southern California. The most famous strike, of course, is the Delano grape strike. A number of people know that um, Cesar Chavez is the face of this strike. Um, but actually, this strike was actually begun by the Filipino Labor Union. It was initially started by 2,000 Filipinos who start the strike first. But one of the leaders, Larry Itliong, he realizes, you know, we can't keep taking turns going on strike, the Mexicans and the, and the Filipino workers. So he talks to Cesar Chavez and says, we need to have a joint strike. The Mexican workers, they go, they vote on it and they agree. And together, the Filipino and Mexican laborers formed the United Farm Workers Union. These are some of the successful um, strikes early on that have solidarity. One of the most well-documented cases of institutionalized um, racism against Asian Americans is the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Most of these, two thirds of them, were United States citizens. They uh, were forced away from their homes and their businesses and put in camps in um, desert areas with barbed wire around it and military guard. And not only were Japanese Americans taken, America even asked Latin American countries to turn over people of Japanese descent. Over 2,200 Japanese Latin Americans were actually taken from um, Latin America. Most of them were Peruvian and put in a special detention camp in Texas and they were used to trade for American POWs. But none of these folks had been committed any crimes. There were no trials, no convictions. They're essentially political prisoners. Another thing to remember about this, this group is that 30% of those who were incarcerated were children. And over 100 of them were actually orphans taken from orphanages throughout California. This just shows how indiscriminate um, this incarceration was. There was a lot of Japanese American activism. Some of them defied these orders and took it to court. There were protests inside the camps. Ultimately though, these camps were um, here for four years. And when they were released, their homes and most of their businesses were gone. Next time you're in Alameda on Park Street, I want you to remember this map. This is a map of all the Japanese American businesses that were in Alameda in the 1930s. As you can see, this was like a mini Japan town. And unfortunately, these businesses all closed during the war because they were forced to evacuate. The two buildings that are left, I believe, are the um, Buddhist church and the Methodist church. But otherwise, this community was wiped out by the Japanese American incarceration. So I've covered a, some ground up until World War II, and I want us to think about what is your relationship to this time period we're talking about and to Asian um, American history? So we're gonna put up a poll. And the question is, when did your first ancestor arrive in this land we now call California? So Claudia is gonna put up the poll next. Looks like everybody's answered. Looks like you're mostly answered. And this is a really interesting wave we're seeing here, right? So most of, um, most of, uh, our respondents here, right, um, came after 1925. So if we think about some of the early history we we're talking about is after, um, and some of us though came, um, can count our ancestors even before 1770. Um, so this is a really interesting kind of um, wave of, of who we are um, in relationship to this history. So thank you everyone for participating in this poll. The most, the next um, section, um, in Asian American history that's very significant is the 1965 Immigration Act. This is critical in how it changes the Asian community. Now, remember we talked about there was a quota system based on the 1890 census and that also had banned Asian immigration. Well, that ends in 1965. The civil rights movement um, is, is a large um, reason for this. 
So there was a relook back at the immigration laws. Quota system is eliminated, but there is a preference for relatives and highly skilled immigrants. Shortly thereafter, the United States engages in wars and military operations throughout Southeast Asia. And so in 1975 and 1980, there are refugee acts that bring in refugees from Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and the Hmong community. And it's estimated you know, well over a million people came from Southeast Asia, refugees. But I want you to notice between these two um, immigration waves is that these are very different circumstances for these immigrants. One set of immigrants is coming where there's relatives, which means there's um, support and networks when they come or highly skilled immigrants, which means they're coming with skills and likely um, some capital. The refugees, however, though, are coming when the United States didn't even have a refugee program. There was no setup for what would happen with the refugees when they came. So they're coming in a, from a, a war-torn uh, area. A lot of families are coming with um, family separation and PTSD, and there's just no network for them when they arrive. So these are very different um, circumstances for um, Asian immigrants to arrive. But even though there's this high variation among Asians, often the whole Asian community is talked about as one flattening piece of, one flattening community, even though there's high variation. And the stereotypes for Asians is, ends up being applied to everyone. The most common stereotype that we hear about is the model minority myth. This is how the model minority stereotypes goes. It says Asians may face some discrimination, but they're really successful because they work hard and they don't complain. They follow the rules and they just inherently have a culture that values education and achievement. It kind of reduces Asians to kind of this robotic drive for success. But the reality is, is that the model minority myth was created. It was created in the late sixties and it was created by sociologists that to counter the civil rights movement. This was created in order to butt Asian Americans against African Americans and try to frame African Americans as problem minorities. To say, well, Asians are, these, these Asians, these one little pocket of Asians, they're successful. So if African Americans are not successful, it's their own fault. But this myth hides that there, when we look at the Asian community and the model minority myth, they're focusing on these professionals that came already as professionals in the immigration wave. It, it totally ignores the diversity among Asian American communities. Asian Americans actually have the widest wealth gap of all ethnicities, meaning there are very, very rich and very, very poor Asians. The, the model minority myth totally flattens that. It also ignores the Asian American activism. It suppresses the activism of Asian Americans in fighting for their rights. And finally, it totally ignores that there are anti-Black policies just historically and ongoing in housing, banking, policing, education, and child welfare that just aren't applied to Asian Americans or to the same degree. The other stereotype that Asian Americans face is the perpetual foreigner. No matter how long you've been here, what generation you are, your family may have been here for 100 years, but they're just considered not real Americans. This is also applied to other groups, not just Asian Americans. It's applied to Middle Eastern Americans and Latina Americans. And it just sets up this idea that somehow you're just not loyal, that you're stealing opportunities from Americans. We see that a lot today in the anti-Asian hate crimes. This also came up in the 1980s. There was a, a recession in America and Japan's economy was on the rise, particularly the auto industry. And we heard a lot of anti-Japanese rhetoric from leadership at the time. And due to that, Asians of all different ethnicities ended up facing a lot of violence. There were attacks by the Ku Klux Klan in Texas on Vietnamese fishermen with military style to attacks on their boats and their communities. I wanna to point to what happened in 1989, which is, which is pretty close to home here. This was the Cleveland Elementary School Massacre. A shooter, he was a white man who had talked about anti-Vietnamese sentiment. He created a diversion that made the school evacuate. And as the kids were evacuating onto the yard, he shot 106 rounds in just three minutes. He killed five students who were ages six to nine and wounded 30 others. 
These were all Vietnamese and Cambodian children. I think it's interesting that when we talk about mass shootings, unfortunately we have become a little too accustomed to them. We see what happened in San Jose yesterday. But oftentimes people talk about Columbine as being the beginning of kind of mass shootings and school shootings, but this predates it. And it doesn't seem to stand in everybody's memory, perhaps because these were Southeast Asian children who were, who were the victims. But we do need to remember that they were the victims and this community has long-term trauma from this shooting in the 80s. Again, after the attacks of September 11th, we see this rising up again. Although the um, perpetrators of 9-11 were not South Asian, South Asians become the targets of a lot of the racial hatred afterwards and hate crimes. Just in the first week alone after September 11th, three different South Asians were killed by so-called patriots. There were over 500 hate crimes against South Asians and Arab Americans after September 11th. Unfortunately, the most common target are men of the Sikh faith. There's this conflation of racism of, between Sikh men and Islamophobia. And they are constantly being targeted, even today, ever since September 11th. The Oak Creek shooting um, by white supremacists in 2012 is one example. Recently, somebody who was wounded in that attack recently died as a result of his wounds, and it's almost been nine years later. But again, Asian Americans have consistently fought to be recognized as their full selves, and we should be very proud in the Bay Area that this is the birthplace of ethnic studies. In 1968 at San Francisco State University, the Black Student Union was the first ones to call for a strike. They were asking for um, changes in admission policies, but also to have the African-American experience included in curriculum. Pretty quickly, Asian American, Chicano, and Native American students join in the strike called the Third World Liberation Front. This is the longest student strike in US history. My parents were strikers here um, at San Francisco State. It ends up creating the first College of Ethnic Studies in the entire United States in the spring of 1969. Berkeley is only a few months um, afterwards, so they really do happen concurrently. And both of these strikes were very violent. The police were, came in and beat protesters. The National Guard was actually called in on, the, on UC Berkeley protesters. So this fight for ethnic studies is critical in thinking about not only Asian American studies, but, but all of our um, histories. But though the strike gets a lot of attention, it's important to remember that the work after the strike was just as critical. These institutions were counting on the students not being able to create ethnic studies. So when the institutions agreed to end the strike and give them ethnic studies, they thought there's no way these students are gonna pull it off. Student groups in both these universities actually had to build these um, ethnic studies departments and, um, and make them long-term and viable. My father was part of the student group that created Asian American studies. And my mom ran some of the early programs of Asian American studies at San Francisco State. And a lot of the strikers in both of these um, universities end up creating a lot of the organizations we know today. They, they create organizations built around ho housing and poverty and health for the Asian American community. They also built um, organizations to fight for to support affir affirmative action and bilingual education. So it's just really important to understand that Asian Americans have never been silent throughout this history. They've always raised their voices for their rights. These are just a sample of some of the other movements in the last you know, 30, 30 40 years, um, whether it's housing or landfill after Katrina or school bullying of um, children of the Sikh faith. But I wanna also highlight the deportation of Southeast Asians. When we think about our community here in Alameda County and Southeast Asians, it's important to understand that Southeast Asians are four times more likely to be deported on old convictions of other, as opposed to other immigrants. They were, they were targeted in waves, um, ICE raids during the Trump administration. And so understanding that this is a very um, big concern in the Southeast Asian community here in Alameda County. This is the diversity of Asian American community in all of the United States. We haven't even been able to have time to talk about Pacific Islanders, unfortunately. But you can see how there are many different groups 
There's over 50 ethnicities and 100 languages. And it's actually pretty evenly split between East Asian, South Asian, and Southeast Asian communities. Asian American as a term came about in the um, Asian American study and in the ethnic studies movement. And unfortunately, what bound us all was not um, a common language or religion. It was that we all face a similar discrimination. But we have to also remember that we also have come together and fought for our rights. And that's what also binds us. So just again, this history, understanding this history um, helps us understand that this anti-Asian violence we've seen is not new, that Asian Americans have not been silent and that we've been here for a very long time. So I'm gonna hand it over now to, um, to Glenda. My name is Glenda Kith. I'm an analyst, uh, a data analyst and data and policy analyst here at First Five. Um, I want to give a little background about me so I'm a cis woman. I grew up in Alameda County. My mother came from the Philippines. My father came from Cambodia. Uh, we actually uh, sponsored for a lot of Cambodian refugees to come here as well. So I, I really resonate with that history that was covered. Um, and they were farm workers uh, and low income. So that's just a little bit about me uh, before we start. <clears throat> I wanna give a, a warning to all you folks so uh, this section, there will be graphic and offensive images and headlines that reflect anti-Asian coverage in the media. Um, take caution if you have children, especially children who are watching your screen. If you can, you know, take some time to go to another room. Um, it's okay if you can't. Um, and this is also a limited look at stories and, and headlines. There's so many. And, it, and it's okay to step away if it's a lot. So from the previous section, we see that anti-Asian racism is not new, but the recent national rhetoric and scapegoating brought, astron brought hate to an astronomical level. We saw the then president, Dem Donald Trump, with a large platform saying terms like Kung flu, China virus, um, blaming Asians for COVID. And we're also in a technological age where this um, is like wildfire. And um, I know this slide is very busy and a lot of my slides are gonna be busy and bombarding, but don't worry about reading everything. Um, this section really just wanted to reflect the way I feel and maybe many um, APIs feel this last year. So there'll be a lot of things coming at you at different, um, different places and, and causing a little bit of trauma. So we see in the media that elderly Asian Americans face physical violence. Um, many Asian families rely on grandparents for caregiving. So this very well may be directly affecting children. However, this is just a small part of the violence Asians face. So Stop API Hate uh, is something that grew out of San Francisco State and they created an online platform to self-report um, Asian hate incidences. Um, in, in March 2019, 2020, they started and in over a year, they got six, over 6,000 incidences reported to their website. Um, lar largely the hate incidences happen in public areas, streets, parks, businesses. Largely they were verbal harassment and shunning, but they also were physical and civil rights violation and online bullying. The victims were mostly women. And though the, the media covers a lot of elderly incidences, the reports show that youth um, have like double, almost double the, um, the incidences as according to this report than elderly incidences. Many of the respondents are Chinese, Korean, Filipino, and Vietnamese descent, but it spans across the whole diaspora and even to people who are mistakenly API. Um, activity, um, if, you, if, you, um, if any of this information is new or affirming, please like, um, interact with folks in the chat. 
So another form of violence I want to talk about is economic. It's a lesser known form of violence, vandalism, driving customers away, unemployment, work hazards, uh, workplace discriminations. We saw Filipino nurses die of COVID at a much higher rate than all nurses. Um, we uh, covered before that the APIs um, are considered model minorities and next in line and well off, but that's not true of all subgroups and especially the Pacific Islander subgroup. And then the next thing I wanna talk about is violence against women. So we saw in the a Stop API report that they are mostly women. Um, so the nation mourned for, for the victims of the Atlanta spa shooting. We saw mass murders of people of the Sikh faith three of whom were Sikh women. We saw over-sexualization and fetishizing of women, victim blaming, verbal harassment, um, fear tactics, et cetera. Unfortunately, many of these incidences involved women's children and families as well. So uh, it brings us to this poll. As I, as I covered a lot and you saw a lot of headlines, I want you to think about um, this question, select like which uh, you most agree or disagree with, uh, the level that you agree or disagree with the statement, reports of and or exposure to anti-Asian racism during the pandemic has impacted my well-being or mental health. This may vary um, from feeling concerned to seeking help. So if you can, Claudia, go ahead and launch that poll. And it's okay if you're not anti uh, of anti uh, if you're not of a Asian descent. Like we all experience this sort of trauma, seeing it um, being being exposed to it, and knowing that we work with a lot of children and families uh, from the Asian community. So we see it leans towards strongly agree to agree. And so as we're thinking about that, um, the effects on us, I wanna transition it to talk about the effects on children. So from the previous slides, we can imagine parents and grandparents who are caregivers and people in the community that look like um, Asian youth are being victims of various forms of violence. So children can be experiencing very vicarious trauma and fear, but they could also be experiencing their own trauma and violence. So children have voiced being harassed and shunned, bullied. When schools opened, Asian children and parents elected to stay virtual, um, some of them expressing fear of anti-Asian bullying. From the STOP API report on youth, about 80% reported being bullied or harassed in half of the incidences, the perpetrator used anti-Asian rhetoric. In about one in five hate incidences, um, they happened at school. It will, two, girls were two and a half times more likely to report the incidences than boys. And over half um, of the cases, 56%, um, perpetrators em employed anti-Chinese speech and blamed China and the Chinese as a source of the virus and also mocking Chinese dietary habits. Um, unfortunately, 48 in 48% of these incidences, adults were present, but only 10% of them um, said that by, there was bystander intervention. And then we also looked at the pre-survey and a majority of respondents said they had issues around race um, being coming up in their in their workplaces, and they gave examples of feeling uh, of being of, um, of bullying, feeling fearful, and um, having race related to COVID. So CDC in two thousand eight um, uh, published a report that said that suicide is a leading cause of death of API teens fifteen to nineteen. So as um, Asian American youth experiences various forms of trauma, it leads us back to the current climate and more broadly, the effects of racism on children's development. 
So I'm gonna stop sharing and I wanna hand it to Jennifer. Um, I'm just gonna give folks a minute. We're gonna not um, ask you not to go far or anything like that, but just wanna give you a moment to stretch if you need to, you know, connect with your breath. Um, you know, just kind of look around the room, you know, we're, it's important as we navigate um, these current times and the history of violence and oppression that we also stay embodied and in connection with each other. So and we've been sitting for a long time, so feel free to kind of um, move if you need to or just kind of stretch and do what your body wants to do. Um, so thank you so much, Laura and Glenda, just such an amazing, rich um, presentation so much. And so um, uh, just, I don't know, so many conversations to be had, right? And um, looking forward to those. So I'm going to pivot to, you know, how do we take and gather up um, history, these histories, this current context, and what do we you know, how do we think about it together? What do we do collectively um, to address these harms? Um, so um, the first thing I wanna talk about is implicit bias. Um, and implicit bias is something that we all participate with in, you know, unknowingly or not intentionally. Some of us may be intentionally, but, you know, I think the majority of folks that you're going to interact with are um, not going to be necessarily intentional about it. And um, there was a study at the, <clears throat> at the Yale Child Study Center that tracked um, preschool teachers and where their eyes were going. So um, our lovely technology these days can give us a lot of interesting data. And so the study showed that um, of the children and, you know, the study itself primarily focused on white and black um, boys and girls. So um, here again, we already have um, the ways in which a lot of Asian Americans are not kind of um, uh, held in mind in, in relevancy. But um, for our purposes here, it was shown that, um, that the preschool teachers, no matter what their race were, were primarily paying attention to black classroom. Um, that meant that if, you know, there were two boys, one black and one white, and, you know, one boy did something like, you know, took a toy from a, a friend, um, and the other boy was maybe doing the very same thing, you know, guess who gets focused on in getting caught, right? And so we have at a very, very, and this is preschool, and um, some of the research is harder, as you probably know, in prior to preschool because, you know, our child care situation and access and it's harder to study if, if kids are all in the home, right? So, um, but we see that from a very, very early age, Black boys are um, already uh, boxed into a problem category um, where they are being watched. Um, and um, the other interesting piece of this um, study, there's a lot of interesting pieces, but um, was that, you know, black teachers were watching the black boys, but they were not watching them in anticipation for them being a problem, <clears throat> but that they were actually watching them um, with protective strategies in mind. Um, and this, this idea that, um, and the burden on um, Black folks, Black family members, Black caregivers, that they have to kind of teach children at this early age how to survive a racialized society. Um, and survive is, you know, very literal, um, as, we, as we know. So, um, uh, so we can conjecture how this might translate to Asian American um, children and families. Um, and I'll get into that in a bit, but um, you know, it's also noteworthy that in pre-K and K students are expelled at a rate um, three times that of children K through 12. You know, so that we're we're doing something uh, 
we, we're having some sort of response to behaviors in young children that is really uh, not adequate. Um, and that um, these expulsion rates are primarily focused on um, uh, little boys in preschool. So um, I'm going to attempt to consolidate a lot of data in this slide. Um, you should have access to, or if not, I'll make sure to put it in the shared file um, for a more detailed report on the developmental um, uh, development around racial identity. Um, so the the key thing um, is to know that this actually happens very, very early. And it, for most of you who know a lot about child development, um, we know that the, the, the really like early sense of oneself in context with others happens very early, um, pre-verbally. Um, and this means that habits get formed and coded within our biological system beyond what words can describe. And a lot can be said and, you know, whole conferences are held on, you know, when we study things like generational patterns, intergenerational trauma and resiliencies. Um, so that there's a lot of things that we don't have lots of, like direct access with language to. Um, but we see that infants notice differences in, um, and start to develop a separate sense of self and identity. We see that one to two year olds start to become, like they start to pay attention to um, the habits of close adults um, and noticing differences. So, um, you know, if, if we're walking the street and um, an adult might be navigating or they might be holding certain racial stereotypes and they respond in different ways, registering certain folks as safe or not safe. Um, children are paying attention to that. Um, and at three and four, we begin to, they begin to kind of develop um, uh, a sense of categories. And they start to see and verbalize patterns. Uh, but they also begin to develop a sense of internalized racial oppression, racial superiority. Um, and there's particular habits around uh, um, folks and categories of uh, racial oppression and racial superiority that they begin to adopt and play out and try on for size with their peers. Um, they begin to verbalize and not notice different concrete differences in physical appearances. Um, they might have some curiosity regarding, you know, why is uh, my skin a different color? Why are my eyes different than the other person? Um, they can sometimes also, um, in as they navigate the larger world, and you know, in three and four in particular, just like the just explosive imagination. Um, they also develop a sense of fear for differences sometimes. Um, and they can have certain responses, for example, for folks with different, uh, different abilities or, di or curiosities for folks. And um, they might tend to overgeneralize, make incorrect assumptions um, and um, show evidence of the social messages that they're absorbing from the folks around them. Okay, and then five and six, um, as they start to enter, um, you know, kindergarten, TK, first grade, um, they begin to notice more and more a sense of what's supposedly normal and what's different. And um, at this age, they also learn um, and it could be a little bit earlier, these are grand generalizations, but they begin to really learn not to talk about differences and to stay quiet about it as a survival mechanism. 
So for, for most Asian Americans, uh, we're familiar with what's called a lunchbox moment. And um, like, I even just have random, sometimes I had a, a random uh, friend of a friend and just like within a few minutes of introducing ourselves, she was Vietnamese American. She, she just said, well, what was your lunchbox moment? You know, <laughs> and that was like our way of connecting. And so lunchbox moment, if you're not aware of, it's, it's um, how, you know, a, a, a Asian American kids might come to school with food that is familiar and um, delicious, I might say, you know, and treated as very, like responded to in a vis very visceral way with disgust, with ridicule, um, and definitely a moment of othering. And so, um, you know, I, I would pack my own lunch, you know, when I was a kid, you know, and, um, and I gathered rice and, um, you know, sorry for the vegans, um, you know, various animal, you know, <laughs> um, uh, meats and um, things of that nature. And I remember really early on, uh, basically having the ability to clear an entire like quarter of the lunchroom with my lunch, you know, that, that the minute I opened up my lunch box, that there was an immediate kind of wave of reaction to my lunch and all the children basically like backed away, you know. So these are these moments that are so familiar to a lot of um, Asian Americans that really fit in that othering experience and that uh, where we oftentimes in the early ages learn to not um, bring focus to ourselves. So this brings us to our question of like, how do we as community um, folks, as professionals, as family members, um, as friends, how do we support children and the families regarding topics of race? So I don't know about you all, but um, when it comes to topics of race, you know, I'm not going to do a poll for time, but like, what is your comfort level in just immediately talking about race, um, particularly when something racist is said? Um, for a lot of us, it's kind of like the, like in the cartoons when the brake pedal gets hit and it's like the full stop screech, you know, um, you know, race, race and racism is, is power packed. Um, and we develop these habits where we just want to push away the discomfort. Um, and so I've had interactions with young children where they just say something that is completely, um, you know, can be racist against me. You know, um, I, I had a young child start making noises like ching chong chong, you know, and I was like, what are you, what are you doing? You know, and, um, and I, I kind of, there was just like, it's such a discomfort. Like, how do I, how do I address this in a more immediate, right? So um, it's very uncomfortable and it's important to acknowledge our areas of discomfort. Um, and I would say the number one, I guess, you know, mistake or challenge that we have in talking about race with children is that we tend to freeze up and we tend to kind of bypass and override or distract with something else or just kind of not be present with it, you know? And of course, there's a lot where, you know, we might be holding our own racialized traumas. Um, we might be holding our own anxieties about, you know, our own sets of privilege and whether or not we want to be that kind of person, you know? Um, so it's important that we take our individual responsibility to get comfortable with the uncomfortable um, so that we can model for the children that it's okay to talk about these things. Um, so that's the first and very large bullet point. Like, so if you take anything away from the what to do, I would say, take that one away, you know? Um, so when the kids say something, then we wanna acknowledge, reflect, narrate with curiosity. So they are watching us very closely, right? And they're really taking our cues in. And so before we jump down to correct, it's really important to maintain our relationship in, with children to act as those mirrors, right? To help them understand that they're being seen in, in this context. And so we want to acknowledge what they said, 
reflect, narrate with curiosity. And for me personally, this gives me a moment to think. Um, like I don't have to actually respond. All I have to do is just like kind of help this kid understand that I heard this, that they said something really important, you know. Um, we might, you know, with the curiosity, we want to be age appropriate. Um, we want to ask short, manageable questions. Um, and they may not know the answer to it. They might by bypass the topic and be like, oh, but look at that red crayon. You know, like they might just kind of um, go over to somewhere else because they're not necessarily aware of everything that they're saying. Um, and we might want to just kind of uh, bite size it to questions that are developmentally appropriate. And then um, this is the important part. So we want to kind of, you know, kind of say like, you know, we want to guide and hold the child in um, relationship and presence. But we also want to be able to find these teachable moments, you know. So if, um, you know, a child, uh, you know, one of the things that my child faced when she got her hair cut really short, um, she really wanted short hair, um, was that the, the girls that she was friends with said that she could no longer play with them because she no longer had princess hair, right? And so, um, it was a moment to teach. Um, and so I think what we, we responded with was, oh, well, um, some people think that, you know, hair should be a certain way or that long hair is princess hair, but I don't think that that's true. You know, I don't think that that's true. I think that princesses can be anybody, you know, and they can have lots of different kinds of hair. Um, and so, uh, you know, particularly in that toddler and early, you know, early elementary school age, um, we can, they can, they have the ability to differentiate, like, is that true? Or is that not true? Um, and take in those alternative messages. Um, when it comes to families, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit, uh, um, and how to integrate community and um, families in our different settings. It's also important to help children feel safe, particularly in the um, anti-Asian violence. Um, and they might come with different worries. And so we want to help them feel connected, feel seen, and to know that they are helpers, right? And so a kid might mention something about a grandma being you know, hit on the street and we can, and acknowledge that truth, acknowledge the feeling, but also acknowledge like, okay, well, there's people to help, you know, and I'm here to help you um, uh, keep you safe, right? Okay, I'm gonna pull up this next slide. Um, I'm not going to spend as much time in this one, um, but I'll circle back if we have more time. Um, but I want to give you just a moment for a personal reflection. And to think about like, how would you feel if a child said these things? What would be your immediate kind of like embodied response or stress response? Um, what would be hard about it for you. And if, um, if we can look at like the, the formula that I talked about, you know, to uh, try not to freeze up, um, to acknowledge what the kids said, uh, maybe ask some questions, like you're noticing uh, that the dolls have different skin and the dolls have different hair. You know, um, that could be an example of an acknowledgement. I see that you're you're noticing that they have different hair and skin, um, and um, there can be a question: What does it mean that you think that that's ugly? You know, um, and then the teaching response could be like, Well, some people maybe think that this kind of hair is pretty and this kind of hair is ugly, or this kind of skin is pretty and this kind of uh, skin is ugly, but I don't think so. You know, I think 
that there are a lot of beautiful things about each and every one of these dolls. Um, and with the second example, um, this is a little bit more in a social interaction piece. Um, it's really important that we teach children um, at an early age and that we ourselves get comfortable with how to manage um, interpersonal relationship and conflict resolution. Um, and so I think a lot of times our conflict resolution in our society is like, say sorry, you know, <laughs> but it's not really a teachable moment for these kids. And the, these kids are in a moment that's teachable, you know, and so there's opportunity to build empathy. There's opportunity to build awareness of other person and how our words impact others. There's an opportunity to allow for somebody to say, I don't like what you said. Um, and to bring words to setting boundaries. Um, all of those things are critical for relationship. And so um, it's really important that we're teaching for having a pre-existing formula of conflict resolution um, as early as we can. Okay. So it's important to look at, you know, what are the two main conduits in which children learn? And I would kind of say it's like all of us, but, um, and I don't know about you, but, um, you know, I think particularly in this distance learning year plus that our, um, you know, um, children have been in of all ages and college students and, and, and et cetera, and today, <laughs> um, you know, that it, it's been really hard to maintain these relationships. Um, and we see a lot of children struggling with education when you take out relationship from the factor, right? Um, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this relationship piece here and the next slide I'll go to stories. So children are constantly absorbing the verbal and nonverbal of the adults around them. And they register the sense of not being seen or acknowledged or being kind of honed in on unjustifiably. Um, so you can imagine with the model minority myth and the perpetual foreigner, how these things can be kind of implicitly infused throughout. Um, and, you know, if you think for a moment to like uh, about a time where you felt understood, like you just got that the person got you, right? Um, if you take a moment to think about how do I even know that a person gets me, right? Um, I think you'll find that it's, it might be in the language they're using, um, but I think that you have other senses, you know, your spidey senses, if you will, to understand that there's, a, there's something in that interaction where the person just kind of gets it, you know? Um, and then if you think about a moment where you feel totally unseen by a person, and this happens um, a lot, it, you know, I navigate this a lot professionally. I feel like I'm a person that has, has pretty decent words for things, um, pretty decent ability to describe things. And I'll have these moments where I'll say something, uh, particularly when it comes to race, and it's just like crickets. <laughs> you know, it's hello Bueller times, you know. So think about those moments that you have where you just feel completely unseen and what happens to your system or what happens within your um, nervous system. You know, it's, it's usually a stress response um, or a kind of a, a type of confusion. And so for kids, we can imagine what that might be like. Um, um, If we take a moment to, to think about how these implicit relational messages get translated to children, um, many of you may be familiar with Carol Dweck's growth mindset studies. And she's not specifically studying um, Asian Americans, but she's studying how children respond to different messages that they're given and the impact it has on their performance or their ability to tolerate frustration in learning new skills or their ability to think about what is involved with learning. So um, 
children these, um, you know, spatial puzzles. And one set of children were told that they were so smart when they finished it. You were so smart. Look at it, you finished it. Um, and then the second set of children were told, I saw that you really tried, you know, when you got the red puzzle, you really tried to figure it out. Good job for trying. And so the second round, these same children were given a choice. Do they try the harder puzzle or do they stay with the puzzle that they already just, um, put, they already just did, right? And what she saw was that the children who were told that they were smart didn't try. They stayed safe. They, they began to be boxed into a, a framework where, well, gosh, if I don't succeed, I'm going to just like, you know, like I have to like fulfill this narrative now that's been placed on me. Um, and then the children who were told, well, you really tried. They're like, oh, well, trying is part of learning. So um, let me see what else I can do. And so those children that were messaged and acknowledged for their efforts um, learned that part of learning is trying and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. And so we see how children absorb these different messages, um, you know, uh, about themselves and the impacts that it has. Um, and I think that we see that the, like, for example, um, uh, one study, I apologize, I don't have it in front of me, but one study had shown that um, the model minority, within the model minority myth, um, it showed that it actually negatively impacted um, uh, young girls in their math performance, young Asian American girls. Um, and, you know, the, the, this idea that you're supposed to be good at math um, actually worked against their ability to access um, math performance. Um, uh, the, the next thing I want to talk about when it comes to relationship is, uh, you get these big words, therapists love big words, uh, this idea of epistemic trust. And the make is really around like, how do we learn? And how do we integrate the world around us? And trust is trust. So um, there was a study done with 18 month old um, kids and um, the, the researcher would come into the kid um, and, with, and there would be two just really randomly shaped toys. Um, and the first thing that the researcher adult would do is really pay attention to that kid and really sync up like, um, you know, just really engage that kid and, you know, just shower the kid with a, like positive attention and curiosity and, um, develop that relationship. And after that um, relationship is set, the researcher would pay attention to one toy and be like, oh my God, this is the best toy ever. I love this toy. And the other toy, the researcher would say, yuck, look, no, you know, and then um, leave the room. Um, and then a, another adult would come in and ask the kid, which toy should I play with? Tell me which toy should I play with? And um, consistently, the kid would pick the toy that the previous researcher would say, you know, I love this toy. The second set of kids, a researcher would come in, but instead of paying attention to the kid and developing that, that kind of um, back and forth, you know, synced up relationship, they would just pay attention to the toy and just like, love this toy, yuck this toy, and leave. And that set of children, when the, when the next researcher came in and asked them what toy to play, there was no consistent valuing of the toy. Um, and so the, the research was really around how critical it is for children to be in relationship with folks around them. That they're really, their ability to take in different values, different sets of information um, really is contingent on this interpersonal network around them. So with that, it, it, it's, I mean, again, I'm so grateful that this um, training is um, 
happening because we we collectively there's you know this soup this smog this you know racial foundation that all of us um, exist in right this country that is built um, on the backs of black and native folks you know this country that's founded on a paradigm of trauma and oppression right like nobody alive today created this paradigm that we exist in um, and so not any one of us can be the solution to fixing it but we all have uh, you know, a collective responsibility to be in relationship with ourselves, with each other, and with these, uh, with the, our communities around us, and the vulnerable folks in our communities, and the children, um, in order to really kind of create these relationships. Um, the good news is that relationship is very healing to trauma. It's the key to trauma, to healing trauma, and so that we all have that capacity. Uh, to be with each other in a healing way. Um, um, I believe I put an article in your folder, um, it, which I find just really interesting. Um, but that there's there are these concepts in, and experiences, even though Asian American is a socially constructed, you know, political term, it is, um, there are these, you know, certain areas of common experience and um, in, in being kind of dehumanized, attacked, erased in a variety of different ways throughout our history. And um, it's important for us to collectively kind of understand those habits. Um, there's no way I can completely articulate them for all um, Asian Americans because um, they can vary. Um, and, uh, but that there's this um, idea that, that I, I think in general, our habit in centering whiteness in our society um, and in, in this habit of pitting Asian communities against black communities to justify racism against blackness or black folks, um, that there is this um, kind of like racial dissociation um, that we can participate in and dissociating you know, just like that cut offness, right? And racism really requires a sort of dissociation. We have to cut people off from humanity. We have to cut ourselves off from our bodies. We cut ourselves off from our root sources or that the society um, actively cuts us off from our root sources. So um, we, it's important to understand too that we don't know what we don't know. We need to know more. Um, and that integrating, um, integrating ourselves our, and holding each other in our experiences is, is a start in relationship to figuring out how to how to um, unpack um, specifically well racism but specifically anti-Asian racism. Um, for example, you know I, I think it's really important to actively decenter whiteness. So as a therapist in mental health. Um, all of our healing models, there's there's like a you know collective colonization, <coughs> excuse me, in the field of mindfulness and a lot of Asian um, century old wisdom packaged up in books and sold um, to white folks profit, you know, um, but it really is cut off from a lot of wisdom and um, healing ideas, right? And so, um, for example, um, <coughs> excuse me, I've been talking for too long. Just take a moment. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so what we want to focus on is how to decenter that white paradigm on things. So, for example, um, I think in our westernized, infused, really, planet, um, we have an idea of what leadership should be, for example, right? Leadership is like kind of big and loud and up in the front and, you know, talk, <clears throat> talk more so people can hear you. Um, and that may not be as culturally um, consistent with a lot of Asian cultures. <clears throat> um, and there's, you know, in particular, like in Chinese culture, there's the concept of, um, you know, face and respect. And so 
even if I'm not speaking up directly against something, um, doesn't mean necessarily that I'm taking a passive stance on something. And so um, it's important that we understand like how our assumptions around values such as leadership or <clears throat> you know dissent can take different forms. Um, there's a uh, you know uh, Asian American Chinese American uh, playwright uh, Henry David Huang, and he focuses. Uh, I think his last musical is called Soft Power. And it's like this idea that you can influence in many different ways. Um, or a lot of you are familiar with, um, you know, Bruce Lee's Be Like Water concepts, right? <clears throat> These are ways that, you know, uh, leadership can take different forms and that there's actually a fluidity to things, doesn't need to be super rigid, doesn't need to be super point on. Um, but, you know, I can say for myself, for example, a nonprofit. Um, a lot of times I'll be, I'll be present and um, uh, engage. Um, and I may not be the first person to talk and take up space, but that doesn't mean necessarily I don't have something to say. And I think one of the earliest experiences I had in a, non, in a nonprofit agency was um, being referred to an assertiveness program, um, <laughs> which, you know, um, I was like, very confused by it in my, you know, as a 22 year old, but, um, you know, it was just a way that I wasn't being translated and understood um, in, in a culturally um, relevant way. So I have tons of things to say about that, but I'm going to have to move on um, to our next thing. So <clears throat> this is a main tenet of critical race theory, and it's the power of um, narrative storytelling. And it's one of my favorite um, things because I, I find it so much more um, conducive to a practice of liberation um, versus uh, being in a constant response and reaction to harms that are done. Um, and you know, one of my favorite things is um, you know just this, this idea that storytelling and making space for our stories <clears throat> and even constructing the stories of the, the reality that we want to live in, you know, and, you know, full acknowledgement to Afrofuturism, magical realism, you know, these, these really powerful tools of um, anti-oppression where we get to imagine forward the lives that we actually were created for, right? Um, so because kids are natural born storytellers, um, this is a perfect thing to infuse when responding to children and their families. Um, and if you watch a kid, they don't just tell stories. They don't just sit here like I'm sitting here and, you know, talk. They tell stories with their full bodies, you know, and um, they, we, you know, <clears throat> I worked with a toddler that was in an accident and, you know, we, we were processing the trauma and there was not, <clears throat> there weren't words necessarily, there was, but there was language. And so that toddler was like, and this happened, boom, wow, you know, and then the, then, then whoa, and then, you know, <laughs> and the, the toddler's whole body was it, present in that, you know, <clears throat> and the sounds and everything like that. So we have many conduits to being able to pass down stories. Um, there was a <clears throat> study in Duke that talked about resiliencies, and um, it was a it was a study on um, basically if if folks could answer these you know kind of twenty questions. I'm not quite sure how they came up with those specific twenty questions, but they were like, <clears throat> you know, what where did your grandparents grow up, or where uh, you know stories that were having to do with a person's context, their roots, their ancestors that um, they tend, those folks tended to do a lot better despite ad <clears throat> similar adversities to other folks. Um, <clears throat> and so a lot of the Asian American folks in our community um, have not even been asked to come in and bring <clears throat> their stories forward. And so I think it's really important that we involve the children, their families, to really be present, you know, not to burden them with having to explain to us 
what their experience is, but really to make space and wait <clears throat> and allow for those stories to come forth. Um, <clears throat> many of you are aware of this concept of Sankofa. Um, it's a uh, Twi language uh, from Ghana term that means to go back and um, gather up or collect. Um, <clears throat> and I really like this idea, uh, particularly as a Taiwanese American um, person, because you know so much of my family's context was cut off um, in their attempt to not stand out in the society, in their attempt to master being in this country. And um, <clears throat> for example, the um, my mom was literally told that you know if I was um, taught raised in a bilingual home or multilingual home because there was Mandarin, Taiwanese and English um, and for my grandparents, Japanese, um, <clears throat> that I, it would, she, in her words, you know, what I would have been, uh, my brain would have been damaged. And that was the link, the, the communication um, at the time that I was growing up. <clears throat> And the, the damage to that is that I can't speak to my grandparents. You know, we speak through food. Um, we speak through um, the limited Taiwanese that I can understand. Um, and a lot of smiles and nods from me, but um, it really has cut me off from a lot of the access to stories in my family. Um, and impacts a lot of um, folks <clears throat> in their sense of self. All right, I have many more things to say about that, but <laughs> uh, I will say with, when working with kids and families, um, I love uh, utilizing superheroes, sci-fi, um, just really the, we are only limited by the expanse of our imaginations <clears throat> and children are hungry for stories. And I can say like growing up, I didn't see a lot of folks that looked like me, um, <clears throat> and, uh, but I actually projected um, Asian-ness on folks. So I actually thought when I was a kid that Snow White was Asian, that um, Wonder Woman was Asian, that Superman was Asian. I just basically picked any brunette and decided they were Asian. Um, but that, you know, children are hungry for stories. They're hungry to be seen in the stories around them. Um, and they're just, you know, kind of waiting for those to come forth and be held in that. All right. <clears throat> um, this last slide is, in, you know, how can we communally come together? Um, so, so as an organizations, as networks, we really want to make sure we're, we're asking ourselves constantly, who is not here that is in the community? How, what, are we, what do we need to do? to open the door to folks that maybe the door has not been opened to. <clears throat> we want to, you know, take active steps in involving families. You know, what would it mean? What do you want us to know in supporting your child? What, what are we, what do you want us to pay attention to? Um, so we want to really have collaboration. <clears throat> we want to um, create team environments in our agencies. Um, whether that be through affinity groups and conversation and trainings like this. <clears throat> but we want to develop that reflective collaboration and support. Um, and uh, Resma Menachem, who wrote uh, My Grandmother's Hands, amazing book, totally recommend it. It doesn't specifically speak about Asian Americans, though. Um, but <clears throat> um, he, he's big on this is deep. <clears throat> somatic, physical, interpersonal, and soul work um, to unlearn and heal from racism. And that is for white folks and uh, non-white folks. And that this deep type of work takes uh, a deep commitment to practice individually and collectively. <clears throat> so he says you get, <clears throat> excuse me, your people around you. Um, and those are not the people that are going to be like, you're fine, you're okay, we love you anyway. Those are the people that are going to hold you accountable and love and see you and respect you at the same time. 
So whether we do that in our interpersonal life and collectively in our teams, we need to be in deep practice with one another um, and in community with one another. And we need to build organizational teams that have in our, in our systems, you know, so if you have a preschool, are you allowing your teachers time to debrief with one another? Are you building a culture where within your organization that race and racism is acknowledged and other marginalizations are acknowledged as a regular practice? Um, so I'm gonna pause there because I wanna make sure <clears throat> we have time for Q&A, so. And I don't know, Beth, if you're gonna read any questions or you're yeah. gonna welcome folks on. Sure, yeah, I mean, I'm, I welcome people to put their comments or questions in the chat. And there was a couple of questions that came up. Uh, one was, what kind of response do you give or model to the preschool child who says with an attitude, your skin is black and you are black and my skin is white and I am white. That just, I mean, I think you addressed it a little bit, but just they're wanting, wanting some, some ideas about how to talk with children about those kinds of things. Yeah. <clears throat> um, in that scenario, the first thing is like, breathe. <laughs> because there's so much, you know, power packed in that, right? Um, <clears throat> and these hold our collective experiences generationally in the context. So that, that distress and that tension and is going to come up just very quickly in our bodies. So <clears throat> the first thing is breathe. Um, I, I think, stay, again, with the formula, like, you know, uh, acknowledge what they said doesn't mean you agree with it. And like, you're really noticing the difference between our skin colors. Um, and I forget, Beth, like, what did, what did the child actually say in the um, part, but well, I don't have a visual. I know, right? Well, the comment is um, the preschool child who says, kind of with an attitude, your skin is black. With and an the, attitude. Yeah, so I think it's kind of the attitude of someone noticing that's, that your skin is black and my skin is white, I am white. Mm -hmm. so, so it sounds like an undertone of some. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I would say whomever is in that situation would probably know like contextually a bit more because you know this kid, you might know like where's this attitude coming from if there's other contexts of, you know, white superiority that might be kind of coded in there. Um, but I would acknowledge what the kids said, um, acknowledge that they're saying that we have different skin colors. You know, a lot of people have different skin colors. Um, and if you do feel strongly that there is a teachable moment, <clears throat> and I would say, you know, like there's a bit of that gut that you have to trust, right? And with the knowledge that no, but there's no perfect that you can get with this. Um, so you do your best. Um, you know, like some people think that, you know, our skin color or, you know, the fact that you're white and me black, it makes us very different. Or some people feel like it makes that maybe some, sometimes white people are better, but I don't think that's true, you know? <clears throat> and we can, we can play together, we can have fun together. <clears throat> and, you know, we can be friends and, or something like that, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But again, to infuse that teachable moment, and that will be, you'll have to kind of draw a little bit for context. Um, the lovely thing is if you're in relationship with the kid, you have a lot of other opportunities to also right. teach. Likely it'll come up again in some context and you can have other opportunities, like you said. Yeah. There was an interesting, someone mentioned on the comment you said about just, you know, the intervention being say you're sorry to the other child. And um, someone said saying, saying you're sorry, or it silences the child and the child learns to internalize the thoughts and bring shame to the child who experienced the harm without actually getting an acknowledgement of it. So I thought that was a helpful comment. Um, and someone also mentioned about books and that books are really an important way for um, parents and early childhood people to um, help young children have conversations about this topic. Yep. So I, I just wanna thank the three of you for being here 
and for Claudia for helping out today. Um, this is in such an important topic and important time in our history to be focusing and holding up communities of color and in particular Asians. <coughs> and I wanna just thank everybody for attending so much for you being here. We will send you the evaluation and I really hope you complete it so we can know what else you wanna hear. Um, I know that um, Jennifer mentioned affinity groups and here at First Five, we wanna to respond to communities needs and um, let us know what it is that you want in the evaluation. We really do look at those evaluations and it helps us very much. So thank you so much everyone for being here. I wonder if any of you, Laura, we have a few more minutes or Glenda, um, if you have any other comments you want to, anything else you want to say? So thank everyone for uh, attending and listening and um, please let us know in, in the evaluations what you want to see next coming out of this. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I uh, want to say the same. Thank you so much everyone for being here. Being here is like a, a good step um, in, in learning um, a lot of new things for some folks. And um, yeah, please, if you do like this, um, let us know if you don't like this or you see a way we can improve, we're so open to that too. Thank Absolutely. You. Absolutely. So thank you everyone for coming as per usual. A few of uh, the trainers and I are going to stay on and Claudia for a few minutes and uh, have a little debrief to make sure we get to you all the resources and the information that we've talked about today. And so um, if you would, please click the little leave button in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And for those of you who um, maybe have trouble finding it, um, we're going to go ahead and shut off our video and mute our microphones and help and help you leave the, the session. So thank you so much, everyone. And we really look forward to seeing you at our next training. Bye.